Welcome to our Wines of South Africa online tutorial about the potential of old wines. You can expect compact information and background knowledge presented by Andre Morgenthal, manager of the Old Vine Project, Joe Vessels, a world-class sommelier, and Petra Meyer, Wines of South Africa, market manager, Germany. Thank you again, Petra, and for Wines of South Africa to give us this platform and the opportunity. Um, we decided in terms of the format today that the three of us are going to, to talk. Um, I'll lead the discussion with the presentation and then um, Petra and Joe has got the difficult but important questions on, on their notes uh, to challenge the, the, the project and also going forward in terms of our future. So this, everybody always asks, you know, why South Africa and old vines where there's been old vines across the world? I mean, if you look at um, California or Barossa, and I mean, in Spain and Portugal, everything's old. And I mean, the vineyards are 100, 100 150 years old. And South Africa has only got, I think, 10, 10 blocks that's roughly 100 years old. Um, but the thing is that everybody's used old vines on their labels. And they would use uh, Leve Wien in France or Alten Reben in Germany. Um, but it hasn't been actually, this hasn't been a, a standard. So we, we took the lead and, and we decided on 35 years and older. Because if it says old vines on a label, what does it mean? And we're going to dig deeper into that in doing the presentation. But in South Africa, we decided 35 years. Um, I'll get to Rosa and how she was looking for vineyards for almost 20 years, uh, but also talking to our counterparts internationally that uh, Australia agrees with us that 35 is, is the sort of the old benchmark. Um, it's, it's almost like when you've been a student in your 20s and you didn't really think about you're going to grow old and turn 30. Um, and once you turn 30, 35 ish then you in theory not all of us got that right uh, you've got a, a job and a family maybe the dog and less partying over the weekends and a bit more quiet so a vineyard is very similar between 30 and 40 years and this is something that i confirmed with most of the regions that i showed earlier um these uh the vineyards come into balance and and we will talk about that close to the tasting time so looking at the um the uh, the timeline. So as I said, almost 20 years ago, um, Rosa started looking for these old blocks and she had an interest with why old vine wines are different. And um, when she was with Loma Re and she and Mr. Rupert started talking about old vines, they both had an interest in, and he said to her, listen, why don't you go and find us these old blocks and create an old vine series. And at the time, some of um, our winemakers like Eben Sari also started looking at, at this concept of old vine wines. And um, in 2016, Mr. Rupert gave us, uh, well, gave Rusa uh, seed funding to start the old vine project, which in the beginning was quite daunting. And I was at Wines of South Africa, as, as, as Petra mentioned, and Rusa and I, we, we worked closely together because I wanted to know what's going on in the vineyards, to talk to the journalists and uh, she was in the vineyards uh, all the time and we used to bump into each other in a small little restaurant called Green Gate in Cinebosch for lunch uh, by accident no not by planning and she would say to me that she's looking for money for this project of hers and I said well I, no. we just sort of then spoke about the old vines and eventually one day she said to me well Andre I got money from Mr. Rupert and, and we want to start this project and we, I've got to do this and this and that. And so on. I said, but you have the cultures, who's going to do all this? And she sat back and she looked at me and said, well, what about you? <laughs> I said, well, I've, I've, got, I've got a pretty um, interesting, uh, I'm happy with Atwaza and why should I move? It, it sounds very exciting. And, and it literally took uh, two days. Um, it was a Friday and on the Monday I resigned and started this project. And I must say the first year and a half was very dark and, and, and there was no handbooks because nobody else has done it. And I'm, I guess I'm getting at the point where this is a unique project that nobody else has done before. And the most important uh, stage for us in the last year, um, since the last Cape Wine, is the 
the certified heritage vineyard seal, which um, I'll expand on in a while. So the quarrel with old vines is the fact that it's not financially viable. So there's a sort of a 20, 25 year cycle with vineyards where the financial viability drops uh, as the vine gets older and the farmer needs to decide if he's going to replace with um, younger vines or something else that's agricultural more viable. So the temptation is to pull out the vines, but the reality is that the vineyards are, are the, the wines are of such unique quality and, and it's so interesting. And what we're saying is that old vines no, don't necessarily make better wines. I mean, it's like old people, Ian O'Dea always says, not all old people are nice. You know? So it is about um, making something interesting um, from, these, from these old vines, but it depends on, on where it is and, and how it's managed. So we're going to look at what our objectives are and why we are you know, doing what we're doing. And, and this also grew, grew organically. Um, on the left is the Certified Heritage Vineyards um, plaque. So when you're a member, you can um, put this up at your tasting room or some even at the vineyards um, on a small little wall like they do in Burgundy. And Joe, you must jump in if you want to ask may a question. I, may I ask, Andre, how difficult is it to become a member or what must I do to become a member? Um, it's not difficult to, at all. Um, I, it's, I'm not very strong on the admin side, so I try to make it easy as possible for people to, to become a member. So it's a membership agreement with guidelines in terms of viticulture and winemaking, and then um, you pay your membership fee and you become a member and you order your seals to put on your bottles to show that you're certified heritage vineyards. A member and we cross reference uh, the particular vineyard block to the Sarvis records and Sarvis is the industry body that uh, gathers all statistics in the industry and, and it actually that, that made it possible for us to launch this project and, uh, and make it possible and also makes us unique because no other country in the world has got planting records that dates back right to the 1900s. Andre, if I may pop in and perhaps ask you to um, also add a little bit on the structure of the South African wine industry, because I think a lot of this has got to do with old vineyards that are owned by growers uh, or larger cooperatives, which do not necessarily, they are not necessarily in the hands of the winemakers in the end. So perhaps you could just also elaborate a bit about the structure. That, that's a very good point. Um, so we have um, family owned vineyards, estates. Uh, we have uh, primary grape growers like Barty van Lul here on the picture with his dogs in the Skirfberg that produces, uh, grows grapes and delivers to a local cooperative or a, a, a wine growing um, producer. And then what, uh, as I explained earlier, the quarrel here is to keep the, the, the farmers in business. Guys like Barsi here that sells grapes to Ibn Saadi and, and Chris Arlite um, and the Skirfbach area also to the Mali News and other brands. And the, the cooperative is, is, is a big uh, entity and 85% of our old vines is actually tied up in this system, which made, it, it, it was quite a challenge for us uh, from the beginning to convince these cooperatives to be part of the project because we wanted to, them to to keep the vines in the ground. Um, eventually, we've got five co big cooperatives now as members, and we managed to convince them to, to be part of it. And also they make their own wines uh, and they unlock some of these old blocks to our members, which is a very exciting part of the process for us. So I don't know if I answered your question, Joe, in terms of the system there, but that, that's the important part for the old fund project is to involve the cooperatives. Um, what we, to give you an idea, uh, this grower would, for example, uh, deliver his grapes to the local cooperative for two, two and a half thousand rand a ton. Um, with the old vine project's advent, 
uh, and up to now, he can now get eight, fifteen, twenty thousand rand a ton, which makes it worth his while to keep the old vines in the ground, and great wines are made. And we're going to talk about premiumization and and and, and price points later through the research. Uh, the vineyards in the ground is, of course, it's part of our heritage, and um, it's it's part of what we are learning about how we can go forward. On the photograph here is is Rissa Kruger that I mentioned before. Uh, that was at the forefront of this uh, from the beginning, and as I said, for almost 20 years. Uh, to her to her right is Jacques de Boer. He's um, a primary grower in Stellenbosch that belongs to a cooperative, but they've basically now they're selling a lot of their grapes to very, very um, high or premium uh, brands, uh, mostly Chen and Blanc, so, and a great supporter of the project. And then, of course, the international relationships um, with uh, growers, brand owners, um, in the middle of the Johan Kruger that developed, um, at, that joined Naked Wines a few years ago. And the process there was to protect or to save winemakers. And he went to them and said, look, it's almost, it's almost a, a sort of a crowdfunding concept. And said, why don't we um, save growers and save vineyards? And they said, yes. And we got hold of 1.5 hectares, I think, of Chenin Blanc in Wellington for him, and uh, he was very successful. I think he's managing more than 40 hectares of old vines now through that um, project. And of course, the, the relationship between um, the grower and the brand owner. So developing a model where um, on, on my left hand of the bench is, is Ian O'Dea that, that also changes his, his entire model from just making wine, but now looking at old blocks and, and creating a series by himself. But the, the issue here and the challenge here is to have a responsibility with the grower and the winemaker. So everybody wins and everybody makes um, a, a sustainable living from, from the old vine project. How does it work if there is a, is a field, a block with old vineyards, grapes? Do you, do you have a WhatsApp group and first come, first serve, or how do you start trading the old wine grapes? That's a very interesting question. We've been toying with this for, for a few years now. Um, it's been difficult because of the pool that might be available, but we actually, we've launched um, a trading, an active trading platform on our website. So mm -hmm. our members can tell us what they need and mm -hmm. uh, growers can contact us and say, I've got this and this available, and we put the two together um, to then um, trade. Okay. Yeah. So, but are the, are the winemakers then on the platform involved for a longer period with the vineyards, or do they just buy the fruit? Because I think a lot of decisions need to be made already in the vineyard in terms of quality. Yeah, of and you see, the, the actual contract between the grower and the brand owner is something we're not involved with. So uh, it could be a year or it could be three or five year contract or arrangement. I know that quite a bit of these um, arrangements are done by a handshake. And it is quite a, a risky business to, uh, to trade grapes, especially of this caliber. If you can imagine, uh, it, it's quite costly to revive an old vine to maintain it. And it actually in the end, is that it's, it's, more cost effective to manage an old, uh, an old vineyard uh, with less input needed because it looks after itself. Um, but the arrangement is then between the, the grower and the, the brand owner. So in terms of hectares in 2016, we started with just under 3,000 hectares of 35 years and older vineyards. Uh, we've got a total planting of 90,000 in South Africa, which is dropping um, every, every year. And as you can see, it grew a little bit. And then the last statistics that we received from Sarvis shows a bit of a drop. And we were quite perplexed because we were excited to see the growing, to see the statistics reflecting that people are actually keeping old vines in the ground and stop pulling them out. But uh, it was quite interesting in our second webinar, um, Rudiger Gretschel from Vinimark mentioned that that drop is due to the fact that about 30 years ago, the plantings were uh, heavily virus infected and those vineyards had to go. 
So as I said earlier, not all old vines make great wine. So for me, there's three sections of this 3,000 odd hectares. The first section is what's looked after and spoken for. So there are brand owners looking after those blocks already. We don't have to worry about them being pulled out. The middle part is what um, Rico at Vintra always says to me. It's like saving the rhinos. You know, we, I'm, I'm, I don't have enough time to get there soon enough. And when we do talks like this, people tune in or they attend a talk and they come to me and say they're so disappointed. They just pulled out so many hectares of 45-year-old Shannon last month. They didn't know about the project. So um, that is what, what we're losing in the middle there is, is the good stuff. And then the last third um, of uh, our old vines is the stuff that really needs to go. Um, it's virus infected. It's really beyond repair and uh, unfortunately has to go and make place for, um, as I'm going to explain later, uh, to plant to grow old for the new vineyards. Do you think there are more old vines vineyards to discover, Andre? Yeah, we, we discovered all the time, and Rissa has beautiful stories of how she actually would walk uh, in a vineyard doing uh, normal daily work, uh, looking at, as a viticulturist. And then the workers will say, but uh, they heard that, that she's involved with this old vine thing, and there's a block over there that's overgrown and neglected, but every summer, you know, or, or spring, they can see the leaves, and they know it's a red block or a white block, because they go and pick the grapes and they eat it. And uh, that's how we discovered, or Rissa discovered, some of the most special blocks. Um, we were in a block last week, a Sinso block, and one of our questions that we received before the, this webinar was, how can you actually look after an old vineyard? What must you do? And the, this old Sinso block that is now, that grapes go to the Manor News uh, for their red blend, and they also make a single bottle in Wellington uh, Sinso, it carried about 500 kilograms a hectare, and it's a small block, I think it's two hectares. Um, it's now carrying almost five tons a hectare. So you can revive an old block by very, being very careful in terms of viticulture, mulching, and multi-nutrient, um, uh, uh, yeah, mul uh, so it, it's macro and micro uh, feeding that you have to to give the, the vineyard to, 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 it's almost like looking after old people, you know, it's not like, it's, you can compare it like, you're not looking after kids in high school or, or you know, it's, it's, it's an old age home and you have to be very careful and gentle. It's not um, students that live on um, high octane coffee and, and, um, and what, what is this thing that gives you, gives you wings, the, the red bull. It's, it's more um, Earl Grey tea, and in our case, rooibos tea, you know, and that kind of thing, to be careful with the old vines. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's the, about the old vine. Andre, yeah. that's a question uh, that I wanted to ask. We've seen some beautiful pictures over the past few slides about um, bush vines, um, uh, these lovely fingers out of the earth. The question is, um, are all old vines bush vines, or are they trellis vines as well? Uh, and what is perhaps better or does it make a difference? Uh, I, can, I can talk about South Africa. Uh, a lot of the old vines I've seen overseas are bush vines. Uh, but in South Africa, uh, I would say most, I would say 80% would be bush vines. Uh, a lot of them have been trellised and on a, on, on, on a single line. But over the years, that's fallen apart, and, and, and by nature, the vine grows sideways um, and becomes sort of a, a, a semi-trellis bush vine. I think that old vines do better as bush vines, but um, you, there's no rule of thumb. So it, it's, it's mostly bush vines, yeah. But I've seen great vineyards that's trellis that's old, old Shannon. This is just to give an idea of the spread of um, old vines across South Africa. People often think that Swartland and West Coast, because of, of the hype around the region, it's got the most, and uh, it's partly true, but in Stellenbosch, Paul of Wellington is where we see the most um, old vines. And uh, it spread up the West Coast uh, due to trading, which we learned from the farmers that uh, 
the, the traders went to buy dried fish. And I heard this from Yambulan Kutsia one day, who is from, that, from, from the West Coast, that the, the traders came from the harbour in Cape Town up to Feldriff um, and to, to buy dried harders and snook to take it back to Cape Town. But on their way, they would take stuff along for the, for the grape growers and uh, grape cuttings was one of, part of it. And that's how these vineyards in Skurfberg and the footpath and so on originated. So that's on the left, you see Lambert's Bay and Clan William. So at Clan William, uh, you turn left and it's about halfway towards Lambert's Bay on a small plateau. And there's only three farms there with grapes that, that, that Rosa discovered. And there's some beautiful stories about those farmers. The photograph of Barsi van Lul with his dogs earlier is, is in the Skurfberg. And I think that um, if you talk to Rosa about it, that's basically where the whole thing started for her. So she got there, um, a viticultural consultant called Johan von Jun, uh, it was at Vinpre at, at that point, I think, told her about this, these vineyards and it used to go to a cooperative, all the vineyards. And um, she found that to, to start the, um, the old vine series at, at, at Antonio Rupert Wines. And uh, there were so, so many blocks that she started calling um, Eben and, and Chris Arlight and the Malinus. And so the, the word spread. And those, those videos are all spoken for, and it, it makes fantastic wine. I have Andre, a question here, Andre. From, sorry, Joe. Now it's you. Now it's you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have some old vine shenna just for the moment. Go for it. Um, when I look at the map, there's something interesting that comes up. I mean, if we talk about old vines, we often think perhaps of historical regions. And um, a place such as Constantia, which is known for uh, things like the Bon de Constance and uh, um, Musca de Frontion, I, I'm quite surprised to not see any old vines on this list uh, uh, from Constantia. Is there a reason for that? Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question um, because that's where the first vineyards were planted. And then one would think that that would be, there would be old vines there. And then, then we had a question via email uh, about um, marginalized or hot areas. What's the best for um, old vines? So Ruth and I had a chat earlier about that. And it seems like old vines or the vineyards survive better in drier conditions, which is contrary to what Petra explained earlier about Riesling's in Germany, which is a, 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 a basically a wet environment. Um, if you look at Greece and Santorini. So, and interesting enough, if you look at the map as well, uh, the concentration of old vines is not so much to the east and that, that we can touch on, on climate change later, but we, we're seeing uh, trends, rainfall and so forth, changing from the left to the right of the map. So from, from west to east in terms of viticulture. Uh, that's a whole different discussion, but it's also very, very part of our, our research we're doing. So uh, in a wet environment, the vines are prone to utapa, which is a wood, wood-borne disease. So the vineyards start dying from the inside out and um, they just don't last. So it seems to us that uh, we found the most um, successful old vines in drier, warmer regions. But it, okay. uh, we don't like to generalize like that, but it's a... Petra? Yeah, I have a question here where people are asking, are there um, are some regions more open to the concept? I think you've answered that. But um, is also the old wine concept more appealing to certain generations of winemakers? Well, it is, that is also interesting because long before ever anybody spoke about um, old vines, I mean, uh, Rosa and Ken Forrester um, went to Pekingese Cliff t 20 years ago already for Grenache. Charles Back as well, later Bruce Jack, Jan Buller could see a Neil Ellis. Uh, long before we, we understood old vines and knew about it, and um, Mark Kent made the um, Bucharest Cliff Semio from those 100 year old Semios in Franschuk along and he didn't even put old vines on the label. So I don't think it's a generational thing. Uh, I think it's more, it happened the last 10 years. When I was still with Wines of South Africa, 
the trend was obvious and people were interested in, in the old vine concept, never mind if it was Jan Poland or, or his, his, his son-in-law, Adi, or, or Eben Saadi and them in Swartland that pioneered old vines there. It's, it's about the old vine concept. First varieties that arrived um, were four of them, but Chenin Blanc, of course, and you asked me earlier why Stellenbosch had so many plantings. I mean, it's just obvious that Stellenbosch um, and, and, and Chenin Blanc um, synonymous uh, in a certain extent. And then um, the smaller plantings that's so interesting now in, our, in the portfolio is Sensa, Palomino, and Semio. And uh, a Conobar now, um, I've tasted a few very interesting Conobars recently. So we'll have to look out for that and Claire Blanche as well. So that brings me to probably the most important part of, of, of the, the narrative is the certification seal, which I mentioned earlier. And it basically reflects uh, product integrity and quality. And of course, the traceability that I mentioned um, through service. Uh, I think it guarantees the consumer um, that those five um, uh, items. Uh, Joe, you, you said earlier that you would like to mention the value of the seal within your environment. Well, in, in terms of my environment, and I think also for uh, the consumer in general, um, it's, it's always interesting uh, with my studies at Geisenheim of international wine business, there was a lot of uh, focus on, on branding and differentiation and, and what producers can do to really make a product stand out. Uh, they always look for a little help in terms of a back label or whether it be also from an additional stamp or, or seal. Uh, whether it be a rating or in this case i think this this uh, certified heritage vineyards um, emblem is something that that will wake a bit of interest um, i think if, if i were a consumer that that doesn't know about it and i would look at a bottle and see this and see the planted date of 1974 i would think what is this how does this affect the, the vine or, or the wine and uh, and is this the vintage or I think, I think it'd be something that could create some uh, interest and curiosity uh, and really make uh, also this category of South African wine stand out on, on shelves for consumers. Um, in terms of me in the restaurant, it's, uh, it's always good to have this uh, uh, certification and to know that it is true. I, um, I've also had experiences uh, working with, talking with winemakers and uh, not in South Africa, but elsewhere as well, where you speak about uh, vines and they say, yes, the vines are old and you ask them, how old are these vines or when do you consider vines to be old? Then, you know, you often get the question uh, answer of about 20 years or until I see they, they do something different, but there's no real certification or something that really states that, that something is made from old vine material. So for me, this is also uh, a sense of security uh, if I were to buy a bottle with this, uh, with this uh, certification that I know it really, it has an origin, um, it uh, is being looked after and basically that the value that I'm paying for it as a wine buyer is going back to the producer and back to good grape material. Um, and yes, it's, it's an interesting story to also share to my guests. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks Joe. So, there's three research projects that's been going on for the last few years that I'd like to share with you that um, Ruiz always says, we always um, thought we are pretty, but now we know we are, because it's scientifically proven that old vines are different. And the first was uh, old vine pinotage research at Canonkop, where uh, Professor Berger took um, genetic material from the old block that's uh, 53 years old and also from the young interplanted vines that were seven years old to see if they're gen genetically different. It indeed showed that there's a difference, that genetics are, are, are different in old vines. What it means for us, we don't know yet, but uh, it is definitely uh, a fact that the, the genetics change over time uh, and the research is ongoing with this. Um, at University of Stellenbosch as well, uh, there was a task team put together, a tasting panel to see if the, the aroma profile of old vine shinners are different from young vines, and they indeed found that. Uh, and as you can see, it also included mouthfeel differences, and the aroma wheel uh, was actually adapted 
um, and these flavor uh, indicators were added to the existing aroma wheel. Um, I see um, Ina Smith, uh, who drives the Chile Blanc Association in South Africa, is also online. So welcome to her and, and well done with all the great work for Chile Blanc and Old Vines. The last and, and also ongoing project uh, uh, driven by the UCT Business School by Jonathan Stein is to see what is the value importance and, and of an old vine indicator on an, um, a, a wine bottle. So the first phase is completed and it actually showed that, um, and I, this, I know this is a very complex slide and I mentioned earlier that my, my background is not exactly what we're looking at. There are much uh, more clever people in the audience that will be able to analyze this, but the, the result of this research is that for every year that a vine uh, is older, that bottle of wine will translate into a more expensive wine. Uh, it was also found that the consumer is willing to pay an average of 300 rand uh, per bottle for this is African wine who want to raise quality, raise image, raise prices for uh, the grape grower and for um, the brand owner. Is the certification seal recognized by the law or is it just something um, which is taken care of by the Old Vine Project? Um, the agreement between the Old Vine Project and Salvas, which is the industry body governed by the Water Spirits Board and the Department of Agriculture, so it's an industry-driven um, initiative. So it's, it's, it's not by law, but you can't put that planting date on that seal if we haven't cross-referenced to the planting record. So in a way, it is regulated, yes. About a year ago, we had a visit from a, a, a French nursery called Antav. They realized that the Chine Blanc that arrived on our shores a few cent centuries ago is genetically different from what the Chine Blanc was that was sent away out of France. And they came to sample uh, DNA from the 10 oldest blocks, Chenin Blanc blocks here in South Africa. We spent a week together. The material went back to, um, to France where they cleaned it up from virus. But we also discovered that we have some virus free Chenin Blanc um, in Skurfberg, which is very interesting and a great discovery for us because virus is such a bad thing and, and um, dangerous for our viticulture. So, this is an exciting project that's run along with Vititech in PAL, which is our local um, nursery in, in terms of research and, and promulgating for um, our, our vines. And the nice thing is that the, the relationship between Old Vine Project, Vititech and, and Antav is that that material is going to be, become available to our growers um, here in South Africa once it's uh, cleaned up and quarantined. Mm. And in terms of, um, of our vineyard workers, it's a, it's a passion for us and, and for, for Rissa especially. Falco partnered with us from the beginning. They sponsor our, our um, training courses. So we, we do old vine pruning courses every winter before pruning starts. Um, it is, of course, a very important part of uh, viticulture and to ensure that we have great wines, because you can't make great wines if the, the work in the vineyard is not done professionally. So that's our contribution and um, upliftment with and empowerment of our vineyard workers. And, and the, 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 the objective for us is to bring people from pruners to master pruners and trainers. And that's exactly what we did with our classes. So the classes are small, but it's basically um, a representative or two from five or eight of our members. And they take the knowledge back to their pruning teams. Mm -hmm. And what we've also done last year is we've trained um, some of Ruissa's top pruning team members who then trained um, the, the teams last year. Andre, sorry, if I may pop in with a question. Um, yep. this, is, this is perhaps a, um, related to the question about pruning, but um, it's all good and well that, that there's the, we know that the vineyards need to be handled a little differently, uh, also be taken off closely, but do we see any different general viticultural practices, perhaps in the vineyards, um, or uh, do these vineyards also require a bit more, perhaps, uh, an organic approach? Or are there winemakers or viticulturists that also work biodynamically with these vines? Uh, what is the general feel about what these vineyards need? 
that's a good question and, and it's, it's a long answer. Um, but okay, to, to prune um, old vines is like sculpting. It's not pruning, it's not uniform. As I mentioned with the old age home analysis, uh, analogy earlier, you have to look at each vine separately. That each vine has gone through 30, 40 or 80 years of lifespan in a different way and has, has endured the weather conditions in a different way. It's like Professor Deloire um, said, we, he was at University of Cilibos back in France now, but he always said that it's not like human beings that can, we can open an umbrella or, or, or run inside or switch on the air conditioner. You know, that vine sits there and has to get used to the environment. And um, uh, that's what we're trying to figure out with research as well. Why do they survive where they, where they did? Um, but yes, uh, mulching is very important, uh, careful pruning, not hard pruning, um, uh, where there's dead arm disease, for example, you don't cut the dead arm, there's often, um, there's two reasons for that, there's often some nutrients in that so-called dead arm that the, the vine uses in tough times, and if you open up such a big wound, you expose the vine to, to virus and infection. So you have to be very careful with old vineyards. And as I mentioned earlier about the nutrients, um, and also uh, what, what Rissa prescribes is kelp. It's a kelp product because it's um, a natural product and it contains everything that the vine needs. Um, reviving the vineyard, as I mentioned, that old Cinso block um, is basically being very careful. It's, it's organ organic approach, mulching, and the multi-nutrient um, supplements. Mm. And very careful pruning, very gentle pruning. And how about cover crop? Cover crop, yes. That goes part of that, yeah. Mm. We were in, in Johan Reineke's vineyard last week um, where it's biodynamic and there the, it's, a, it's a very unique process, of course. Cattle roaming the vineyard and there's this, this whole cycle of the the the, um, the, the the grape skins and the cuttings going into the kraal for the cattle and then the, the droppings in the vineyard, um, composting the vineyard. Mm -hmm. The only concern is when the cattle start um, snacking on the budding leaves and <laughs> the grapes. Okay. Um, yeah. So environmentally, as I've, I've been alluding to, is the, it's very important for us uh, considering climate change learning from these old vines uh, why they've survived and uh, we coined the term plant to grow old so we we, we soon realized that from the onset where it was vineyards 35 years and older we need to protect uh, our so-called heritage and our viticultural heritage it's about people there's a strong humanitarian element behind it uh, saving uh, uh, the, 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 the grape growers the workers developing a business model that will work for them but also to, to plant vineyards that will grow old successfully um, through learning from the, the vineyards that has been there for so many de decades. These old vineyards have never been irrigated. Yeah, often it's dry land. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, the, the simple rule of thumb is why start irrigating when it's 60 years old, when it's been surviving for so long without water. Mm -hmm. um, but some of, some of the really struggling blocks it doesn't, it doesn't do any harm to irrigate a little bit. Mm -hmm. But what, um, uh, what I've heard from what Ruiz has done at um, uh, Mr. Rupert's farm, Rubik's Rafir, where with careful viticulture and mulching, you can actually reduce irrigation from four to six times a season to once a season. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. being water wise. It's, it, it, it is, um, it's about, as I said, being water wise. So you also um, looking at varieties that are more suitable for warmer conditions. So there is a project that's running um, uh, in the last 10 years where varieties have been brought in and um, I know Eben has planted quite a lot of it, uh, Mediterranean varieties that's different from what we're used to. Mm -hmm. um, planting at altitude as well. Mm -hmm. So irrigation is, is a matter of the site, 
where the vineyard is and, and the variety. And if you plant varieties that don't need so much water or the site is such that you don't need, then it's better. Okay. That was actually one of the questions that came to mind when, when, you, when we look at the grape varieties that were mentioned in the beginning, um, based mostly on Sinso, Columba, um, Chenin Blanc and, and so forth. Um, what will that look like in future? Um, will we have more Cabernet Sauvignon or Shiraz old vines, or will it be in the future a uh, Tempranillo, Arbarino, what? <laughs> or will it stay but, more based on, on, this, on this pattern that we're seeing from Shannon, uh, Columba, Sonso? My, my crystal ball is a bit fuzzy on that one. <laughs> but, um, you know, with the, with, with the work that Vititech has been doing and is doing in terms of cleaning up, uh, material, uh, better material, cleaner material being available. That could be the, the fact that we now don't even see Cabernet Sauvignon within our portfolio of old vines. I know there's a block that Rosa found just a couple of weeks ago, but um, the virus has been too bad. So we, 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 we try to, to grow out of a period of virus infection. Um, pretty much how we're going to try and grow out of this COVID virus situation and to survive it and be cleaner going forward. So um, I'm not sure, but I, I suspect that we'll see, um, uh, let's call it foreign varieties or non-traditional to South Africa varieties uh, more prevalent um, going forward in the next uh, two, three decades. Um, what, what are, is it possible to do field grafting with old vines? Uh, yeah. In other words, bring on... Field yeah, yeah. There's, 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 there's two schools of thought about interplanting. Um, when uh, and, and Petra has asked me earlier the, the, what's the difference between replanting and interplanting what Rosa did with that vineyard um, that she brought from the Swartland for Mr. Rupert to Lomarin uh, he asked her he wanted an old block on his on, at Lomarin in Franschuk and there wasn't any and he asked her to replant uh, a, a block an old shinen block she first said, oh, it's, it's a difficult one. It's like replanting old roses, you know. And the thing is, if you, it must be north, south, east, west, and you can't turn it. You've got to replant that vine or rose as is, because it's been used to the sun coming from this side all its life. If you turn them around, um, they won't understand what's happened. Um, it's like, it's like um, also relocating um, elderly people. And if you do it wrong, um, they don't last too long in an old age home and it's over. So she did this and um, the block got replanted um, to Lomarö with about like a 98, 99% success. Um, Mark von Buren makes uh, the old Bostock Shinnen um, from that block. So the economic impact and the media um, value is amazing. and. Um, Joe asked me earlier, why is it that it's successful? And uh, um, we don't really know. And we can talk about it after the wine tasting, Joe, but the, the, the media coverage, when Platter Guide, uh, uh, Philip Van Sel came to me a few years ago and said, can't we add a, your logo next to each of your members' wines? And that had, had already introduced the category of old wine. So you walk into a wine shop, you look at a wine list, and you'll see white wine, red wine, whatever, we've actually, unbeknownst to us, uh, which is something Jonathan pointed out to me, um, that's doing the research at UCT, that we created a separate category that's never actually been there and acknowledged. Um, so in retail, we see uh, that it's called Old Vine. Um, and this year, we'll have five platforms where Old Vine will be a category um, in terms of awards. I've mentioned Platter Guide, um, Veritas and the Terroir Awards, and then Michelangelo, and then um, the Old Mutual Trophy Wine Show run by Michael Fridgen, and we'll actually have a, um, an Old Vine Trophy for Best Old Vine on show. It's different, it's interesting. There's some sort of mysticism around these old vines, and it's about, and especially when you visit the vineyards and you feel the energy. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember when I worked in Burgundy at, at Domaine Bertania, and I walked in those old, old blocks. It was just at, at clos You feel the energy um, and you feel it in these old blocks as well here in South Africa. It, there's, this, there's, this, there's a special energy that is translated to the bottle. 
So basically, we've we've created a triple bottom line, which is a very um, academic term. And again, going back to my background, I'm not very familiar with this. Um, but we've looking at our social environment, um, uh, our our, uh, uh, our natural environment, and the economic business model to try and make it work for the grower, the brand owner, and ultimately for the old fund project to also survive um, in the long term, which is which is my challenge this year um, in terms of economics. Um, and then consumers. Uh, resonate with old vine because of trends in let's say wine tourism um, in the world at the moment uh, people want knowledge when they go somewhere uh, they want don't want to just have leisure travel they want to learn something they want to go away that with something that they've learned about where they were and there's a story stories sell wine um, and there must also be a purpose and identity in terms of where they were it's, it mustn't just be a generic it must be something very unique. It must be sustainable in terms of earth. Our, our, um, the generation now that's looking at wine consumption is concerned about earth and our future. Um, I'm going to quote um, Rosa by saying that COVID-19 is nature's way of saying that she's angry with us. Nature is upset with, with how we've been treating earth. And um, old vines is, uh, is, is by nature, um, nurtured and and health health of course and then experiences you know if you go on experiences and you tell stories that that's pivotal to to once to, to the entire experience of of the one consumer okay I, I can only agree from my side in the restaurant it's you you see these choices is i don't think it's only a wine uh, theme it starts with the choice of uh, water that that uh, guests buy in a restaurant when they go out shopping to to supermarkets, uh, looking at fresh produce or um, fisheries. People want to know as well. They want the traceability. They want to know that what they buy is sustainable, uh, and they they are consuming in other ways. It's it's not no longer uh, a process of of of. Um, just buying something because it's good. It's about, it's uh, they want to buy something because it makes them feel good as well. Um, and yeah, the stories are very important. Um, these are four interesting um, elements that that we've learned. Firstly, the what the vineyards got its own agenda. They don't care about the fact that we want to make wine from the grapes. They are growing to survive, and that's part of what we're trying to learn from them. Why are they there? Why are they trying to survive so badly? And then the root system is very interesting. It's a, it's a myth that old vines got very deep vineyard or, or root systems. Um, professor, the late Professor Archer always said, it's like students, they, they follow the, the path of least resistance. And that's true. What the vines roots need to do is get to the nutrients, get to the water, for example. So it could be quite deep, up to 10, 40 meters I've seen. But I also saw a, a, a root system in Rioja last year that was easily 10 meters long, but this shallow. So it just hit a different soil type and went sideways until it found resources. Um, they also are very prudent with their resources and the reserves. They're like when I mentioned earlier, when you're in your 30s and 40s, you start looking at your pension fund and you don't, you don't spend so much money anymore. And this is exactly what they do. And there's, there's, uh, there's, it's a fact that an old vine reads the, the vintage. The old vine predicts the vintage. The with old vines, they've got more roots. So there's one root with lots of small little roots. Mm -hmm. So they, they actually maximize on how much they can draw from what they have because they know they're growing old. They, they're suffering from dying vine syndrome. They must, they know that they have to derive as much as possible. So they grow more small roots. So the, the, the actual cluster is bigger than a younger vine. Okay. The transplanting of the block from uh, uh, Swartland, um, they brought as much soil with as they could and the entire root system. And the hole that they dug for each vine was one square meter and 1.2 deep. 
okay, and I've, I've, I've spoken about wisdom and experience. I've seen the movie. They know how to manage the vintage, and I've we spoken about the root system. So finally, what is actually, as I hand over to Joe, why are these wines so special? And these, these four answers is what we've been hearing from winemakers across the world, sommeliers. Um, the first answer is complexity, palate weight, texture, aromatics, the, the palate length uh, that makes these wines so intriguing. Um, so at that point, any questions? We can move over to, to Joe to talk about the intrinsics of wine. Okay, um, so um, I have three wines here that uh, were generously provided by the winemakers and the distributors um, to try. Um, I do feel a little silly on the one hand because this isn't a uh, tutor tasting and I know that a lot of those watching do not have these wines also at home. Um, so I don't want to do a full organoleptic tasting of the wines. I think we can just basically discuss um, what makes them special and um, how I basically see the value of them. Uh, the first wine that we have is uh, from the Swatland, from David and Nadia. Uh, Saudi, I believe that David is actually online as well. Um, I must apologize, there's a little um, mistake in the slide. This is the vintage 2018, not 2017, um, but uh, just as good, uh, <laughs> even better perhaps. And uh, yes, um, and this is uh, actually not from, as I understand, not just from one single vineyard, and that they are Different, different parcels of vineyards that are bl uh, blended together, up to seven as far as, as far as I understand, and this should be an expression of the Swatland. Um, but I think in this case, you, there's the seal, and we can see that the oldest vineyard, as I understand, was planted in, in 1962. That is really old. Um, <laughs> and yes, um, in terms of Chenin Blanc from South Africa, there's a variety of styles, and I think a lot of us think of South African and New World wines as being these fruit forward, opulent wines. A lot of us think, a lot of, us think of the Sauvignon Blancs of New Zealand, for example, or the Chardonnays of California, or really these, these, these fruit bombs. And yes, they make a great impression, but I think a lot of us um, are looking for subtleness and, and really finesse in wines. Um, and when, when I open this wine, and also trying it, it's it's not uh, it's not a fruit, fruit bomb. It is, it's really a beautiful, subtle wine. There's elegance to it. Um, it's not it's not this ripe um, or fruit that jumps out of the glass. You have to go search for it. It's a bit more of your bruised apples uh, and dried pineapple, um, bruised apples, dried pineapple kind of style. There's there's lovely spiciness, uh, herbaceousness to it. There's there's some fennel. Um, happening there is um, some some almost like a chalky minerality. It's it's a beautifully complex wine. Um, Joe, if I if I may, yes. Um, what what we also found with with when you taste um, old vine wines is that the wine often often uh, reflects the the site and not necessarily the variety. With younger vine wines the Chenin Blanc profile comes through, but with older vine wines, it actually shows a sight. You can taste a wine and say Skurfbach or Swartland or Stellenbosch Chenin, for example. I can, I can only agree. I've also heard of colleagues that, that, that say that it's, um, they get a lot more of secondary or tertiary characteristics, so not necessarily from, from the grape itself, but also more in terms of the winemaking or the sight. So I can only agree with that. Um, in terms of speaking of winemaking, I think also this is uh, this what I really enjoy about this is this one. You can notice there's minimal intervention in the winemaking. There's uh, 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 I think that uh, David and Nadia are doing a good job here of of accompanying or uh, being uh, they accompanying the site and the grape and the vineyards, but not not dominating the winemaking style. That really something comes um, comes forward in the wine. Um, I tasted the wine just now again and. It's still there. It's, uh, there's, a, there's a lovely liveliness to it. Uh, once again, the chalky minerality that is coming through. It's got amazing length, uh, complexity. Uh, this is really a beautiful one. It's, it's uh, something that I would really 
put more into a style of a classic great wine. And it's really substantial. It's uh, something that I can really envision for working in, uh, in terms of gastronomy. Um, also dishes that show some complexity in the way that they were uh, created, also with a variety of different components. Something such as a good smoked trout. Uh, you, can, you can add some earthy components to it as well, some fruit components. This wine will really accompany everything very well. Uh, this is an example of a wine that uh, if I had guests and they were to say they don't know what to drink and they want one bottle to accompany them throughout the evening, this would definitely be something to do that. Um, and the, the, the story behind it, I think, is, is, is incredible that you can actually also then communicate the story and the essence and the energy of, of, of what is happening down there. Um, so, yeah, that's... that's the. Um. Joe, the interesting thing about this particular wine is that often these old blocks are, the, the wines from these old blocks are from single, single parcels. And as you mentioned, it is from seven different parcels, uh, this particular wine. So it's a blend of different sites that includes soil types that range from granite to clay to shale um, and a bit of limestone. So it's it's interesting wine in itself that stands apart from 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 David and Nadia's um, single vineyard wines. That we see in that, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'll move on to the second wine. How did you calculate the thirty-five years? Was it based on organoleptic impact when reaching thirty-five years? Or was it, uh, was it because you had the vineyards available to make sure you had enough vineyards to start the project with? Um, as I explained earlier, it was a discussion that we've had with many people across the world and a sort of a general agreement that the vine comes into balance, physiological okay. balance. And the, the bottom line is the juice that you get into the cellar. Mm -hmm. high, high acid, perfect pH and low sugar for some reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, it hangs, the grapes hang longer, but the sugars are lower, the alcohol is lower. And that comes back to that health benefit from the previous slide about wine tourism. Uh, this is the Buchanan's Clove Semillon 2017, the grape variety that uh, is both beautiful in terms of gastronomy and one that is particularly close to me at heart. Um, we were speaking earlier about the, well, I think there's a lot of storytelling about the history and and the heritage of South Africa and um, there's a lot of focus on on uh, Chenin Blanc um, but what a lot of people don't know is that Semillon was at one stage the most planted grape variety in South Africa and I think there's still some amazing material down there um, and I think it's also a style of wine that can really bring that can be an ambassador for South Africa if, if you think of Semillon throughout the world um, we know it more for perhaps the Bordeaux blends, the white Bordeaux blends, or perhaps from the Hunter Valley in Australia. Um, beautiful styles of wine, but I think South Africa can really come to the fore and also showcase this wine. Um, the Bucanos Semillon, Bucanos Club Semillon 2017 vintage, uh, still a bit young. This, uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm uh, quite sad that I don't have anything but old because this wine ages amazingly. And um, in this case, it's, it's a wine that you can also still smell the youth a, a bit uh, and that it, it needs some time. But once again, it's a bit more of a subtle wine, a um, little bit more of your, your uh, lime zest, a uh, lot of spice once again, uh, orange peel. There's, uh, there's once again a big complexity. I do notice a little bit of, of use of oak on this wine, uh, which I think is done quite nicely it's it's not oak dominant and it will actually help the wine to also age quite uh, age gracefully and I think it will gain a lot of complexity with time as well um, it's it's got a beautiful palette weight textural it's uh, it's uh, really something that will hold up very well with uh, with uh, good food as well so also amazingly live and fresh brilliant acidity um, and yes for me for me it's interesting uh, because on the vine or on the bottle, in no way does it state anything about being from old vines. Um, whereas the David and Nadia had this lovely little um, uh, uh, seal, uh, the Buganos Club doesn't. 
even though it's also from one of the oldest vineyard sites, if I'm not mistaken, 1902 or there around, Andre? Yeah, the oldest block. Oldest block, yeah. And that's, so, that's, where, that's where you and I went, was it last year or? Yes, uh, two years ago, I think it was. Yeah. And, 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 that, that, um, was, that was an amazing experience. I think, Andre, you were saying about earlier about uh, just the energy that you also experienced in Burgundy in Côte de Vigeau, and that, that was for me also one of these um, experiences that you can't, you can't communicate it in words. I think um, if on, even for those of us that haven't been in vineyards, if you think of just the calming effect and the energy that you have perhaps in the shadow of an old tree that has been there for centuries, um, and just basically feeling that presence of, of something that has been there for so much longer than you have been on this earth. Um, that is something that defies words and uh, that, that just makes it so, so special. Um, so yeah. I have a question. Would you suggest for these wines to decant them an hour before the time? Um, it always helps, a little bit of decanting and development always helps, um, and especially the book of notes curve, I think, uh, could do with some air, but I think it also needs patience. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm lucky, I still have a bottle of 2004 or five back home, and I'm really looking forward to visit South Africa again and crack open that bottle. Uh, so have some patience or open it up and, and enjoy it throughout the evening. Um, for me, it's interesting also about the, the uh, the Semyon, um, I heard from Andre an interesting story about the vineyard because I, originally I thought it was 100% uh, Semyon, um, but I heard that there's also some Muscat in there and perhaps Andre you can tell the story of, of where the Muscat comes from and what happened to the grapes before it got added to, to, the, to the Semyon. Okay, I'm, I'm getting it from both sides now, from Nadia and Petra about timing, so I'll be quick. So the winemaker, Gottfried, went to look at uh, the senior block on a particular farm there in Franschuk and saw the muscat, asked uh, the farmer's wife about this. She said, no, I cook jam from it every year. He said, well, I like it. So he made some wine and, and blended it into the senior. Uh, um, third bottle, now we are moving to um, Ian Odea, who's also in the panel. And this is his... Uh, Old Vine Sinso, Vintage 2015. Uh, Sinso, which I also appreciate because it's, uh, it's something uniquely South African. And um, the, the styles of wine are also something I think very special and uh, uh, great in terms of gastronomy. It's not one of these big, bold, heavy wines. Uh, Sinso, I don't know if you can see the color, but it's, uh, it's, it's a bit more light, a bit more translucent, um, really a bit more delicate. In terms of the profile, it's it's it's. Uh, I know I said about the others that they are a bit more uh, tertiary and and holding back, but this one you really get a lot of crushed berries. It's it's a bit more of a de uh, um, delicate fruit, a lot of floral components. It's quite perfumed. Um, it uh, it's it's just really incredible to smell, and you always go keep going back um, on the palate. It's a light wine, so it's it's not dominant. It's not too much. There's a little bit of grip, but too much, not too much tannin or ec extract. Um, this style of wine, I think, it's it heads in the direction of 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 what sommiers always love is uh, good Burgundy or even some well-made Beaujolais. So the lighter styles of wine that that we can pair with food um, and not kill the creations that our chefs make. Uh, it's always very heartbreaking for me when, when guests want to order a red wine and they really insist on having those really heavy, big wines. They're beautiful, of course, but sometimes I feel they're doing the food that they order an injustice. And uh, we need to be there on the floor and make such suggestions of wines that really fit the cuisine very well. Um, beautiful Senso, I know the time is heading on. So I, think, I think it's a theme internationally. Um, and the, the quality is there, no doubt. And I think it's, it's a category that we can really promote as well. Uh, I, uh, as I said, and I think we mentioned earlier, there are other old vine associations throughout the world. There's the old vines Barossa chapter, there's the vineyard movement in, in Chile, for example. There's also in California, I think with the Lodi, old, old vine Zinfandel movement carrying on there. So th there's interest internationally in terms of this category, but uh, in terms of what the old vine project 
is doing and really setting the benchmark of what old vines are and and how to work with them and supporting the industry i think that makes this category of wine really special um and yes i look forward to seeing more of these wines uh in restaurants i still have an open question here which i more or less will would like to answer because a part that needs to sort that's something you know that needs to be addressed directly to andre this is the question how expensive or producers complain it's too expensive to become old vine certified um but i think we unfortunately don't have the time now to go in a deeper discussion but the the second part of the question is what can be done to encourage these farmers to preserve old vines and i think what can be done from our market side is very much to promote these wines and showcase these wines. And I also address towards the retail and trade to actually emphasize that the story of old wines, because when I researched for old wines on the lists on, of German importers, I realized that story is not really taken to the point of sale or to the point of purchase. And I think we need to communicate the story, we need to t communicate the benefits. We have to make these wines visible and to make sure that consumers understand why to pay a little more for the wines. And where the Old Vine Project has done its bit is of course to implement a seal, which guarantees the integrity of the term and the quality inside of the bottle. And um, yeah, it should not only be the glory taken to the, to the brand owner, to the winemaker who is the star, you know, we are always talking about these famous winemaker but the money must be taken to the growers. And I love to see the, the people on the ground, in the vineyards, and, and that's where the money needs to go. And, and that's where I get goosebumps. And I also feel the energy that we are closing the circle and that we as consumers and marketeers actually have a responsibility or can make a difference. Peter, if I can perhaps add on that last note of us making a difference, perhaps to the international audience listening. Um, I don't know if they are all aware of the difficulties at the moment in South Africa with the lockdown and there's, there's a complete ban on alcohol sales and it's really hitting the industry and the good people down there really hard. And um, if, if I can uh, usher a wish from my side uh, to my colleagues here, uh, in Germany and Europe, um, let's do our best to promote sales of South African wines and do what we can from here to support the industry and all the winemakers and farmers down there. They are already in a time of need and we can support and uh, enjoy some good wines on the way. Thank you so much, Joe and Andre, for your insights and your commitment to convey this exciting topic in a very practical manner. Dear guests, thank you very much for your attention and your interest. If you have any further questions about old vines or wines from old vines, please get in touch with us. We're looking forward to hearing from you.